Welcome everybody to uh, lecture five on the Holiness Code and the Temple. And um, what I want to do is now continue on just talking to you about how that um, God made Israel holy and, and, and sanctified them or made them holy, which is what the Hebrew word means and what the English word means as well. Um, because that uh, out of a gift and because that they were now going to be able to interact with him in a way that they had never been able to in the past. So his presence sanctified them or made them holy so that they could now interact with his presence, his manifest presence. It would be represented by the tabernacle or the tent, uh, the tent of meeting um, and would also actually have at least his actual personal presence there at least uh, once a year at the day uh, on the at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which reality of it is, it's like everything kind of moves in that direction. And so one of the most important things about understanding the temple and understanding the holiness of interacting with the temple is to recognize that ultimately it's talking about the reality that our bodies are the temple of God now. Before they were, they had a whole standard of holiness that they had in conduct, which it impacted their conduct, their behavior, the food that they ate, they ate, the places that they went, the people that they interacted with, the things that they touched, the the way that they even took care of their own hygiene of their own bodies. Everything had an impact, and on how that they were going to be able to interact with God's presence or a tabernacle, and God in His mercy provided a way for the most part that anything that would make them unclean within those categories, there would be a provision for them to then be restored to cleanness so that then that they could come and interact with God in the tabernacle of witness at the tent of meeting. Well, now Father has taken it to a whole nother level and we need to understand that the, the spiritual dimensions that we now have a requirement for our lives in, and which does affect our conduct, our behavior, the people that we interact with, the things that we do with our life, the things that we do with our body, because our bodies, our bodies right now are the temple of the living God. You know, it, 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 it's such a radical thing to consider that when you look at the, the temple or, or the tent of meeting and you look at all the interaction that went on and the requirements that were in each chamber uh, uh, that was inside of the uh, Mekdish or the inside of the tent of meeting and everything that was on the outside. And we recognize, wait a minute, now we are the temple of the living God. He actually dwells in us. Our heart is the place where the holies of holies is, where as it were the tabernacle, uh, or rather the um, chest that contained the commandments because God's written his laws and his commandments upon our heart and upon our mind. And so the requirements should be, you know, understood on a whole nother level, but the empowerment to do it cannot be uh, where we look to ourselves because that's a violation. It's the same as kind of like a violation of breaking the Sabbath because now God has provided for us in this finished work of grace, his spirit, uh, to be able to fulfill everything that is required of us. And when you think about this body right now, which is the temple of the living God, because I've been washed in the blood of Jesus, because I've been born again, and though it is still corruptible and it's still on its way to a place of death, um, yet God has said that it is his temple, it's his dwelling place, that it's holy, um, that um, we're to, gl to glorify him in our bodies. And then you think about the reality that the only difference between our bodies right now and our bodies eternally is that the corruptible puts on inc the incorruptible, the mortal puts on the immortal. So I still have the same 10 fingers, it's just that they're immortal. I still have the same nose, I still have the same eyes, I still have the same ears, I still have the same head, I still have the same arms, I still have the same legs, I still have the same feet. 
Every part of me is going, of this holy body, of this holy temple that God has made holy in every part of it, in every member of it, and, 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 and made it to where that it is so acceptable and so holy, it is going to be hopefully regarded in your mind right now as being maybe so much more holy <laughs> when we see him as he is. Uh, because we will be like him, according to what John said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. And so that's why verse 4 says, everyone who has this hope purifies themselves, even as he is pure. We recognize, wait a minute, this that I have right now, this gift right now that is terrestrial and, and corruptible, is one day going to put on immortality and going to become more, as it were, celestial, but it's still the same body. It's still the same body parts. And how holy is it going to be then? Well, just look. And so it's going to be so holy that it's going to be able to see him on that level that's going to be able to know him as he is and see him as he is because we shall be like him. Well, remember, we understand what the resurrected body is going to look like, the immortal body is going to look like on the basis of who Jesus is and what he was like before the resurrection and what he's like after the resurrection. And after the resurrection, you could see the nail prints in his hands. You, there, the nail prints was in his feet. The scar was in his side. I mean, that was what he presented to, for example, Thomas. Um, you know, is there... A, a greater glory there also, yeah, um, there are things that we could talk about in terms of, uh, of what he looked like at the revelation that we've seen in Revelation chapter 1. But the bottom line of it is, is he shows us a glorified tabernacle, a tabernacle that has put on the incorruptible and the immortal, and then tells us and lets us know that our resurrection will be after the manner and likeness of his resurrection. And so we can understand things about this, and I hope it helps you to be that much more mindful of just how sacred your body is as the temple of the living God. And so that when you read these things and you're trying to study through these things and you're a little bit confused about clean animals and unclean animals and the things that would make you clean or unclean and why does a woman have to be clean, unclean for uh, you know, seven days with a, uh, um, with a male child and then for, what is it, um, uh, is it... Uh, Forgive me, is it 14 days or twice as long or three times as long for a female? Um, and then why, how about this ritual cleaning? And why is it that they got to wait till 40 days before she's completely clean and, and can come and, and actually um, present an offering before the tabernacle? Don't get into that. Understand there's a bigger picture here, okay? Understand that that was the responsibilities that God gave to them on the basis of the gift of holiness that they had received. And now there are responsibilities that are even, you know, greater to us now that we have received his life and his holiness on a whole nother scale. And, and understanding, once again, this can't be legalistic. It can't be something that's reward-based, works-based. It's relationship. And out of that relationship, yeah, there's works that prove that we have the relationship. In other words, there's fruits, the fruits of the Spirit, that prove that we have the relationship. It's not the other way around. It's not the works to give the relationship. It's the relationship to give the works. It, once again, it's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by his spirit. It's not us doing it with our own ability, but it's what he's done in his finished work. And we don't want to violate his finished work. In other words, we don't want to go over in and start to a realm where we're doing it out of our own human strength, our own human ability, and, it's, and it has wrong motives and wrong inspiration. Because, one, number one, you're going to fail. First and foremost, you're never going to live out a life that only the Holy Spirit can empower you. Only a new heart and a new spirit can empower you to do. So, once again, when we look at the rest of God or the seventh day or the Sabbath, uh, you know, Shabbat, uh, and Shabbos is teaching us that, listen, it's a finished work. Don't you try to do it with the own arm of flesh. It's a finished work. Rely upon that which God has given and which God has done. It's time to enter into the rest. And so we labored in and into the rest, understanding that, look, this is the requirements of God. We're going to say no to the arm of flesh. We're going to say no to our own strength and our own human ability. And we're going to get before God, and we're going to receive those things which he is supplying because he's made it very easy to receive. So let me go on and just 
in my establishment of the fact that God gave everybody the gift of holiness. And here I'm in um, Leviticus chapter 21. And I'm looking here at, um, I believe this is verse 7 and 8 here. They shall be holy unto their God and not profane the name of their God. For the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God they do offer. Therefore, they shall be holy. So he, this is specifically a holiness command that is for the priest. But it can also be understood as a holiness command in, in many respects. Also for all of Israel because they get to partake of, of, uh, some, of some of the offerings. And um, so there's no way you can be handling the holy things of God and then be profaning God by handling things that God has identified to them and given them responsibility uh, for that uh, are things that are unclean or unholy. And so he says, you shall make yourself holy. You shall sanctify him, therefore, or you shall make him holy. For he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy unto you. For I, the Lord, which makes you holy, am holy. So um, here is a requirement that all of the people have, and as well as the priest, to recognize, hey, the person that God has anointed and the person that God has placed as his representative uh, to the people and the people's representative to him, they must recognize that he is holy and they must treat him as holy. And um, so everybody's responsible to do this. <clears throat> everybody had to, <clears throat> everybody had to, <clears throat> excuse me, cooperate with what God had purposed for the priest. And maybe I, 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 in dealing with just the priestly code, I could maybe go into that a little bit, but just kind of seed you for it. You know, God had, had designed garments, garments of holiness for the priesthood, for their glory and for their beauty. And what the Lord required was he didn't require those priests to go out and get all of these things to put their garments together. He actually required all of the people to bring together all of those things necessary to uh, clothe Aaron and to clothe his sons with these garments that were for beauty and for glory that were garments of holiness. And so that all the people were participating and recognizing what God had done and what God was doing in making the priest holy so that they themselves also would regard the priest in the same way and ultimately um, regard themselves also as the holy people of God. Uh, one of the things that is missing for many people that are Christians today, they don't regard themselves as holy and righteous when God has made them holy and righteous. And so therefore, in regarding themselves as sinners and, and unrighteous and unholy, then there is absolutely no understanding of how to walk in holiness. How can someone keep themselves in holiness that they don't even believe they're holy? How can someone give themselves over to righteousness when they don't believe they're righteous? If you believe you're a sinner, or what does a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you believe you're unclean and defiled, so then you are. And people have this concept, but somehow they say, well, positionally, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, I am holy in the eyes of God. Well, you might be, have that as an idea. First and foremost, you don't have any authority in Scripture to believe that. But in, in having that, then there is simply going to be no way that you have a line drawn for you between good and evil and, a, and an understanding of how to keep yourself from all those things that belong to that realm that you say that you exist in. So God has empowered us. He's empowered us with his word, just like he empowered Abraham. He said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. Okay, so there God was empowering Abraham under the, under the reality of who he is, the El Shaddai, the God the Most High, God the Sovereign One, God the Almighty. And through that place that God has and is and the empowerment that he can give, he empowered Moses to walk before him and be perfect. And in reality, that is the only other associated word to holiness that God is going to use 
in the context of Abraham. He's going to specify holiness within the framework of being perfect. And that's a perfect heart. And somebody said, well, what, what do you mean here? Was he perfect in his artwork, perfect in his math, perfect? We're not talking about that. We're talking about character, behavior, conduct, obedience. Obedience to what God says. Will you be willing to be perfect in obedience to what God says? Whether you understand it or not, that's the issue. God has given us the power to be perfectly obedient. He gave us the spirit of obedience. That's what makes us different from all of those who have the spirit of disobedience. Paul addresses those in Ephesians chapter 2 uh, that have the spirit of disobedience as those who are alienated from God, those who do not know God, those that have not been redeemed, those who have not uh, been willing to receive this wonderful measure of grace that has been given to us and supplied to us at Calvary. They've not been willing, in other words, to look at the one who's been lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So it's very important that we begin to evaluate ourselves of these things and recognize, hold up now, God has empowered us, and we're going to have to have the right response and not make it something that it's not. It's all about obedience. God required Abraham to be obedient to the things that God determined that he was capable of being obedient to. God required Israel to be obedient to the things that he uh, saw that they were capable and they were empowered enough to be obedient to. And when we go back to Abraham, my goodness, you talk about that kind of obedience where you're going to take your son that you love and you're going to make him an offering and a sacrifice and you're going to have such a confidence in who God is that you know that he's going to raise him up even after you've slit his throat and turned him into ashes. I mean, think about this, people. That is, is Father's never required that of us, but he has required perfect obedience out of us. It required perfect obedience of Israel, it's Israel and he didn't give them un, the things that were beyond what they were capable of doing. And so we need to then look at what God has made us responsible for because he has given us a whole lot more than any of those that are talked about in the Bible before the New Testament. He's given us far more. And so to whom more uh, is given, more is required. And we're required to live by the Holy Ghost. We're required to walk in holiness. We're required to live in this holiness by the Holy Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, and to recognize how sacred God has made us, our bodies, how sacred He's made our spirit, how sacred He's made our whole being, or our, which is also referred to as our soul. So let's go back and look. I think at this, I haven't gotten this next verse, I don't think. Um, Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed. It's another word to say sanctified or made holy or called holy or recognized as holy. But I will be hallowed like our Father which is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. I will be hallowed. Sacred is thy name. I will be sacred. I will be sanctified or I will be seen or observed to be holy. But I will be holy among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallows you. So it's not only our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's God because uh, we live in his presence because of the covenant that he's made with us has then also then inferred or transferred that holiness to us. And so he made even Israel in all the things that they were doing in disobedience contrary to his word that he had made them holy. He had hallowed them. He had made them sacred. They were to regard themselves as hallowed. They were to regard themselves as sacred. They were to regard themselves as holy. So how much more today are we also then in this gift that God has given to us, regard ourselves as hallowed, regard ourselves as holy, regard ourselves as sacred? Not because of anything that we have done for ourselves, but because, once again, of what God has done for us, because of this wonderful privilege of access that we have to him, this relationship on the level that he dwells in us and we dwell in him and that we're his temple. 
And, and let me say this too. Let me say and remind you once again that if you are not following along also um, in reading uh, the book that I wrote on uh, holiness, a forgotten realm, then I, I want to encourage you right now to just do that. Um, for those of you that are going to be taking a test in this class, you know, I'm going to have at least one question out of that book. And so uh, it's a question that you would be able to answer really easily if you read the whole book, okay? If you really want to understand what I'm trying to teach you in these 45-minute lectures, then you're not, you're, gonna, you're not just going to listen to the lecture, but you're going to do those things which, you know, I outlined in the first lecture for you about how to take these critical words like holy, sanctified, um, holiness, consecrated, etc., put them into your search engine, look up all the verses of Scripture on them, or at least read all the verses of Scripture, and you're going to, you know, also give yourself to, uh, to going through this book that um, I wrote that hopefully you will find that is nothing other than just taking all these verses of Scripture that I'm encouraging you to go and look up and then, then putting them together in a, in a, in a place, in a setting that allows you hopefully to see a, you know, a more complete picture of what God has required. Once again, that's at www.abidingplace.org and it's Holiness, uh, The Forgotten Realm. You can download that for free. Um, you know, I always encourage people, go ahead and, and give an offering uh, because, w once again, you're recognizing that it's, that it's sacred, it, it, that, it's, that it's something that belongs to the Lord. It's out of a gifting that God has given, and you just want to honor the Lord. There's no requirement to do that. However, I think that it's always a good thing to do. If you're going to honor something and you're going to honor someone and it's going to be valuable to you, then the, one of the ways that you respond to that is with those things that are valuable to your own life. So I did, let me go ahead and finish reading this. Um, I think I've got that one. Oh, yeah, because the Lord just, once again, he's saying, I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. So you're hallowed because you're my people. I'm dwelling in your midst. And you're my witnesses to all of the earth of what this looks like. And um, then um, Exodus chapter 29 um, let's look at this verse here in verse 11. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made uh, to consecrate and to make holy, to make themselves holy. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they, um, and a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. So once again, another testament to the, um, uh, the impartation in many respects, you could say, of holiness there. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be made holy by my glory. Just as the tabernacle is made holy by his glory, by his presence, so every person that comes anywhere near his presence is made holy. And the closer to his person, the greater the holiness. And this was understood by all Israel. They just thought that through you know, commandments, they could get this reward. No, it's by what God gives, freely gives. He gave. Aaron was no person special in his behavior and his conduct uh, prior to being anointed to be the most holy person on the earth, to go into the most holy place on the earth. God gave him that out of his own election. Now, God has elected and given whosoever will a holiness that goes even beyond that, that we actually, through the blood of Jesus, we get to walk in with all boldness, as Paul said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, into the holies of the holies, so that we have access to the Father by the Spirit. Now, I want you to think about that while you're just maybe sitting there listening to this lecture, or I'm standing here right now, by this wonderful operation of the Holy Ghost, I have a connectivity with the Father that gives me access to Him that the high priest Aaron didn't even have. Uh, we've received the Spirit of God on a certain level, on a, on a level, rather, that allows us a direct connection with the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ so that His life and ministry may be seen through us and all we are 
as it were, are just simply conduits or vessels of that and are able to have this kind of supernatural life just because of the anointing that we have received. Just like Samson was able to have a supernatural life of strength to be able to overthrow the Philistines that were oppressing Israel, he received this supernatural strength by an anointing that was given to him, by the spirit that was given to him, in other words. So also, we have been empowered with a special supernatural ability to show forth the life of Jesus, to show forth the works of Jesus. It's not us, it's him. So he says that he will go everywhere with us, confirming his word with signs following. Well, how does he go everywhere with us? How does he dwell in us? He goes everywhere with us and dwells in us by the spirit which he's given to us, as John revealed to us, for example, in 1 John 3, 24. So it's very, very important to recognize this divine ability that is imputed and conferred unto us by the Spirit of God that we receive, not by works, but by election, by this grace. God determined Aaron, even though Aaron did such a, such a terrible and evil thing of making a, a golden calf for Israel to worship and actually refer to that golden calf as God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, still God in His mercy and His grace there at Mount Sinai worked a forgiveness and a mercy for Aaron so that then Aaron would then be identified to be the holiest man on the earth. I mean, that right there speaks volumes. I think more people need to talk about that. There need to be more sermons preached about it so that people can understand more perfectly this wonderful election of God, this wonderful grace of God, this wonderful mercy of God, and then understand that that's just not given to one man or a couple of guys. That has been poured out upon all flesh that whosoever wills can now be able to take a hold of these things, become literally the inheritors of this grace, to be co-inheritors with Christ Jesus, and be, a, be an inheritor of all the things that Father has, heir of all that God has, and able and privileged now to function in this extraordinary life. So let me get one more verse of scripture out here. And then um, number 16, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, uh, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. They were right. All the congregation are holy. They understood that, but they didn't understand their limitations in the holiness that they had received. So now what they're going to do is these sons of Levi are going to try, as Moses said, to take too much upon themselves. And they want to go and they want to take the place of, of where Moses stood before God and where Aaron stood before God. And they're going to find out they don't have that much holiness. Every one of them, and, and the Lord is among them, wherefore they lift up yourselves, wherefore, why then do you lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And Moses heard it. He fell upon his face and, and he spoke to Korah. Moses fell upon his face. He realized, wait a minute, you don't understand this. God has done what he wants to do, what he's pleased to do, and you haven't been called into that kind of intimacy. You haven't been called into the fellowship that we've been graced to have. This belonged to just a few people who have received the Spirit of the Lord in different uh, times, in different generations. And Moses being one of those, where he spoke to God as a man speaks to God face to face, where Aaron was empowered with an ability now to walk into the holies of holies and minister before God in a very sacred way once a year to offer the blood of atonement to purify the, whole, uh, the sanctuary that had been made unclean by the uncleanness of the people. And so now Korah and his band thinks that they can have this place of leadership now that they recognize that they're holy. And what they're going to find out is, and it doesn't work that way. He spake unto Korah and to all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even his, even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. So, once again, there was a clear demarcation between the holiness that God had given to Moses 
which then allowed him to get really close to God and come up in the mountain and the holiness that God had given to the people that were had to be you know, separated from the mountain and a boundary set up. And the holiness that God gave to the Levites, which then were able then to minister as those that are aged to the priest. They're, the Levites were much like deacons that were carrying out the orders of the elders, which would be like Moses and Aaron, okay? Uh, the elders being apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They then, which they had received, or Moses and Aaron, had received directly from God. And so you know, praise God, you know, everybody gets a little bit better of an understanding of this because there's so many voices right now. We get uh, the, the scripture as the means to tell us and help us to understand who really God has chosen and who he hasn't chosen. Because if, if someone is not submitted to those things which Paul said in his epistles, <laughs> that maybe God has chosen, but they have erred from the faith. And so at that point, no one should honor them in, in those areas, and no one should follow them in those areas. People think that they're supposed to honor the leadership of God without question. That's not true. We honor them recognizing that they have the authority of God because they give to us and deliver to us the word that was once delivered unto the saints, and they don't depart from that. And God, and in that, we then have that much, that much greater of a witness that truly these are the anointed vessels of God that have been given the Spirit of the Lord in the framework of leadership to make sure that God's people are paying attention to what God says and are, are communicating the Word of God, which is a miracle-working power that in, enables the people and, and this miracle gifting of the Lord. As Paul said, for example where we could impart spiritual gifts um, so that God's people may be established. And so here, Moses and Aaron, they weren't failing. I mean, of course, people could have potentially remembered the errors of Aaron. Uh, they may have seen the fallibilities of the man Moses. But the bottom line of it is they were anointed of God. They were receiving directly from heaven. Just imagine how difficult perhaps it would have been for you because... You know, yeah, there was some special signs and wonders by mir and miracles and accompanying of God uh, with Moses that was unprecedented. But still, people can make believe things and can conjure things up within their own framework of their own imagination to justify their disposition. After all, you know, I seen Moses. You know, who knows? Uh, get angry at, at, at the people of God or whatever. And so, you know, begin to work in, and that would begin to work in their thoughts and say, well, how, how is he any better than me? And so what we've got going on here is sedition. And a, a seditious thing that happens over and over again and, and within the framework of the church. And I want you to understand, when you want to re think about the temple when, uh, and, and the application of the temple uh, to what we have today, there is absolutely nothing that would, re, would, would, would identify the temple or the tabernacle of God and literally the holies of holies, that which is so sacred, as his church. There is nothing more sacred than his church. His church is his body. If you want to really get that, if you want to get the emphasis on how holy it is, Paul says it's the fullness of him that filleth all things. That's how holy it is. Um, he says that in Ephesians chapter 1. He says that it's something more glorious, more powerful, more, more majestic, more terrifying than what was on Mount Sinai. He says it in Hebrews chapter 12. So you're looking at the church there as that which is literally, absolutely, totally connected. And in, in, in the way Paul's saying in Hebrews chapter 12, starting about verse 23, it's just the same as standing in the throne room of God in, in Mount Zion uh, before innumerable angels and the spirit of just men made perfect and God the judge of all flesh and the mediator Christ Jesus. Then when you look at how sacred the Lord Jesus himself makes it and in the book of Revelation, that's sobering. He's standing there with his eyes aflame of fire, hair white like wool, which basically you know, is the symbol of him being the ancient of days, the same description that is given of him in, in Daniel chapter 7, I believe it is. Daniel 7 or 8, Daniel chapter 7. And, um, 
and he's standing there with sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Think about this intensity as he watches his church, as he's judging his church, as he's saying, this is my church. You're, you're, the, you're, you're, the, you're standing in my stead. This is the, representing the most holy and sacred person that exists. And um, what happens continually is something very clear, clear very similar to what happened with Kor and his band in Numbers chapter 16. There are seditious things going on all the time. People will see some kind of fallibility. They'll see something they, that they don't agree with. You know, they'll see the, the, the man of God or the eldership of God or the deacons, you know, that are, are like Levites that are executing the, the instructions of the eldership. They'll see them do something that out of their own bias or own perception or the way that they think... Uh, life is supposed to be, life according to the individual, you know, conduct according to the individual perception. And then they will create a seditious attitude and their honor will, be, will depart. And ultimately, they're going to be in the same condition because reality is they've less, left off valuing that which God has valued. And so I'm not saying that today that there are these various different gradations of holiness. I'm not saying that at all. What I am trying to, the point that I am trying to make is, once again, when I say gradations or gradients of holiness, um, Moses is able to come and commune with God like no one else is. He's alone allowed to come up into the mountain when Aaron and the 70 elders and, and, and are left behind. Um, and once again, read, read the book, Holiness of Forgotten Realm, um, because I'll, I'll really break that down. Um, and then Aaron is allowed to go into the holies of holies. And it's something that I, I, maybe Moses could do. Moses certainly was the one who set it all up under God's instructions and sanctified him. But we have no indication that Moses was able to do that. God gave Aaron a special holiness to go in and see and, and interact with him in the holies of holiness. And not see him, but to uh, administer the, the things of his priestly duty inside of the most holy chamber of all. Then he was given uh, you know, the associated priest with him like his son's rights to be in the holy place. And then the Levites had a holiness to be able to handle and carry uh, the, the, the tent and, and do certain things within the framework of service to the priest, as I've said. And then the, the people of Israel stood back and they watched and there was a certain separation of time and of space between them. Now, God has not done that today. We all have received the same Holy Spirit. We all receive the same measure. It's Father's measure without measure. We all are able to have a wellspring of holiness on the inside of us. We're all able to have this holiness pouring out of us like rivers coming out of the very core of our being. I mean, out of the very depths of our heart, out of the very depths of our spirit. Um, and so, there, there would not be a dissociation in, in, in holiness there. It's just that God gives special giftings. He puts his spirit upon uh, men and women, and, and especially for the purpose of representing his leadership so that all the people may properly follow his leadership and, and be responsible then to communicate his word and responsible to communicate his desires and responsible to watch over the flock of God. And in that responsibility, you're watching over the flock of God more than anything else. You're not only protecting them, but you're instructing them when they err. You're calling them back when they're err. You, you're calling them out. Uh, it's very easy for people to get off and their own little world and start uh, walking with God after their own ideas and concepts of what they think is right based upon their understanding of the Word of God. Praise God then for special giftings, spirit of discernment, a, a divine insight, a connection to be able to be the oracle of God. Does that, does that only belong to the Father's ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers? I'm not saying that either. Um, because God has given that same kind of gifting to all of his people. It's just that he has a special work of grace that Paul very clearly defines as those that he has empowered then to perfect the saints uh, or to mature the saints uh, with 
the word that they need to hear today, the word that they need to hear uh, yesterday, the word that they need are going to need to hear tomorrow. So I hope you can understand that, appreciate that. Know those who have the rule over you and those who labor in the word and give them double honor. That's what Papa says. So let me just real quickly try to go over in this last little bit of time a little bit more about the priestly code. And I've got a lot to say about this. And really where I want to take you so you can understand this and value this a little bit more is I'm going to take you to Leviticus chapter 10. So if I can't get to Leviticus chapter 10 today, and I don't think I can, I'm, I'm pretty much running out of time. Um, you're going to understand a little bit more about the priestly code and the extreme details that were written out so that God's people, his priest, would understand that, look, you're coming into something so sacred, something so holy, and you better make sure that you haven't in any way defiled yourself in any manner because if you do, remember what happened in Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu were consecrated. They were made, another, they were sanctified. They were made holy. They were separated in God. And we're going to talk about that. I want to take you into some verses of Scripture. For example, Leviticus chapter 8, especially in Leviticus chapter 10. And let's look at the build towards this. But before um, we go and we look at the build towards these details that were fleshed out uh, by Moses, for, not by Ezra, not by Samuel, not by anyone else, by Moses. This is not redacted. This is what God had to say by Moses' his servant, by the hand of Moses. Moses wrote it out. By the hand of Moses, okay? I just want you to, in general, look at these things. So, you've heard me say this, that while the holiness code is concerned with personal holiness, priestly code concentrates on priesthood and worship. Uh, that was their responsibility. They stood there in a place that um, no one else could stand in terms of interaction with God, that now we're all privileged to be in because... You know, the Lord has poured out His Spirit upon us, and He wants us to worship Him in spirit and truth. So, there's always an important link between est established, being established between morality and worship. That's very important. Nothing has changed in the New Testament about that. Okay, nothing has changed. There is an important establishment, I'm going to say it again, between morality and worship. You can't walk, you can't be playing around with sin and iniquity. Walk in, raise your hands, lift your hands towards God, and be giving acceptable worship. I'm going to tell you right now, that's worse than strange fire. Okay? So, a lot of things to say on that and to develop that, both from the Old Testament that is, based, that is seen over and over again, and then, boy, does it ever have a big emphasis in the New Testament. Um, the priestly uh, code describes states of clean and, or unclean, and they provide ritual instructions for the restoration of the clean state, all, once again, moving towards Leviticus 16, which is a day of atonement. Um, then the major topics of the priestly code uh, that, that are rituals that, ba or, well, states of being that are absolutely essential for the priest not to be made or unclean or compromised in any way when they come into the holy place. Otherwise, the consequences are absolutely um, severe. Uh, the major topics are circumcision, um, a pa the Passover meal, uh, the keeping of the Sabbath, uh, inappropriate behavior, uh, clean, interaction with clean, unclean animals, purification and atonement, uh, redeeming property, oaths, cleansing lepers, keeping Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is Sukkot, uh, the Nazarite vow, their, you know, and what they do in terms of administering, uh, re by and large, uh, uh, most of these things, uh, uh, all of these things, uh, consecration of the priest, um, or how they're set apart and sanctified, ma uh, made holy unto God, and uh, the ritual of the red heifer. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of these because time would not allow us to, to but I do want to make you aware of them, and, uh, and then I, I also... Uh, we're also going to list out some of the things, especially under, under the things that would ultimately uh, compromise them with respect to making them unclean uh, when they come in to uh, interact with God in the holies of holies. Uh, the, so, um, and I, I've already said this to some degree, but 
once again, the most insightful instructions concerning what would be classically called the priestly code is found in that which makes them holy and then what, you know, that gives them a holiness unique from all the holiness of the rest of Israel. And then the requirements to be set apart and be consecrated under that holiness. And so they're going to have requirements uh, based upon that degree of holiness and those requirements and responsibilities that are associate, associated with that degree of holiness. They're going to have requirements that, the, uh, that they're going to have that all the rest of Israel wouldn't have. They're going to have to live to a higher standard uh, than anyone else. And, some of, and, and like I said, it's, we'll break some of that out in Leviticus chapter 8 and then Exodus uh, 25 through 28. We'll just highlight some things there, and uh, also in Exodus chapter 30. So we'll do that next time. Lord bless all of you. We love all of you. Walk in the Spirit. Love you.